Good morning, everyone. Thomas Montgomery with IIMFL and Smart Money Alliance. We're excited to visit with you this morning. We get together most weekday mornings at this time at eight o'clock central or just a minute or so before, again, Mondays through Fridays to talk with our distribution partners. We have a number of different types of distribution partners. All are very important to our outreach effort. We have affiliates, financial literacy educators, branch office managers, and joint venture partners. And as I mentioned yesterday, our joint venture partner promotion ends here soon, one week from today. So if you've been considering becoming a joint venture partner but not have, have not done so yet, we've got one week left to get that set up under some special promotional terms. So when we get together each day, we're usually gonna have some sort of topic to address best practices, success stories, ideas that, that you might not have considered. And then we wanna open it up for um, questions and, and answers. And so we're gonna use the Q&A function, kind of like a chat box within Zoom. So at any time, if you have questions, comments, concerns, it would be great to go ahead and put that question in the question and answer like the chat box so we can get to that as soon as possible. Now our topic today, now you, you'll see uh, they're shared on your screen, but, but let's step back. The purpose of the topic today is how to work with business bankers in your community. Now that topic runs parallel with the whole concept of leading with education and then could also be extrapolated out of, of what you could be doing at the local libraries. So let's talk about the business banker angle first, and then we'll talk about how we can use the 27 mistake message, even in a broader environment in your community or online. So what we always wanna do is step out of our shoes and think about what it's like from the other person's perspective. So for a few minutes, we're all going to pretend that we're business bankers. So rather we work for a big bank like Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America or a local hometown bank or even a credit union. What, what's our life like when we come into work in the morning? We have goals, we have objectives. Our boss, often the branch manager, tells us that we need to open a certain number of business checking accounts each month. And, and get a certain number of business loans issued each month. So we're motivated as small business bankers to work with small businesses. Now, what's the problem? Well, as a small business banker in this pretend scenario, you and I have to go find leads too, don't we? We have to go find the small business owner that's considering opening a business banking account or switching banking relationships. We have to find the small businesses that are interested in applying for a loan and applying with our bank. So it's interesting when you think about it, that the truth is in fact, business bankers aren't that different from us. Most of them need to find new clients. And if they don't, they won't keep their jobs or won't be able to earn their bonuses. Now, with that being said, secondly, they do have small businesses that often approach them about loans. What we know is that the vast majority of small business owners that approach banks for funding are declined. Typically, banks will encourage anyone to apply to avoid any concerns of discriminatory lending practices, but there could be exceptions where banks filter out. So the first thing that you and I need to do, let's get out of that role play for a second, get back to who we really are, we need to identify who the local business bankers are in our community, and we need to educate them that we have a resource that's available to help their non-capital ready clients become capital ready. But we need to determine if they have a problem that they're looking to solve. And what I mean by that is you can start with a simple question. May I ask you on average per month, how many small business loan declines that you're currently seeing? Now, if they come back with none, what does that mean? Well, either they're not really in that space, so they're not even trying to loan money, or 
they're just disinterested and they're not giving you an honest answer because what you and I both know is that the vast majority of small businesses that apply for loans don't get approved. So when, if they do come back with a number of, of, of some magnitude, now you know that you, you have a problem that you might be able to help them solve because what you and I are gonna do together is take those unqualified small business owner loan applicants and help them become qualified. We're going to help them become capital ready. We're going to help them qualify for funding through that bank. Now it gets a little bit more complicated. Sometimes different banks have different appetites for different loans. And so it may be that a, a bank declines an applicant based upon the type of business or the type of loan that the client's looking for, not really because of their credibility factors. But in general, what's going to happen is we're going to be able to explain to the small business banker that if we could be a resource for him or her, as they have applicants that are not qualified for a loan, that we could take them through our educational curriculum, our programming, help them become capital ready and refer them back to the bank so that bank can then issue that loan. And in addition to that, we're out talking to small businesses all the time, and we'd love to, to refer them to the bank because we know that every small business owner needs what? They need a bank account. We talk about it in the 27 mistakes. Many of them are going to need a merchant card account. They're going to need payroll services either now or, or in the near future. So depending upon the scope of services that the bank offers, uh, you can become a very valuable referral source for them as them for you. So working with small business bankers is one of the best practices to generate a funnel, a flow of clients. Now, we have to think about what are we asking them to, to do specifically? I would recommend that what we're proposing them to do, those business bankers, is to refer to an educational session that you offer. And that educational session should be based around what we're looking at on the screen. So this is all coming together, the 27 mistakes. We have this educational message recorded via YouTube and it's on demand. Go to 27mistakes.org and there it is. So it's kind of good, better and best. What would be even better though is if you taught this curriculum face to face in your community. Now there's some um, challenges that can come from that. Maybe we're in a community that we're not allowed to gather yet. Maybe you don't have space. Maybe you're not comfortable teaching and, and so that's fine. So we certainly have the on-demand resource that's ready right now. There, there's no excuse. It's, it's ready to go. People are listening to it and you can drive people to it right now on 27mistakes.org. But again, what would be even better is if you were teaching this on a regular basis live in your community. Then what you would do is invite the banker out to sit in. And I, I've told you, I work for the SBA, technically the SBDC, and I taught something very similar to this. And I teach it on a routine basis. And it was not unusual for local business bankers or even presidents of banks to come sit in on this to hear well, what is it that we're saying. And that builds their confidence and, and willingness to refer to you. If you were asking them to refer to you for a fee-based service, that would be more challenging and they would be more hesitant to do so. Now, banks are in business to make money, right? That they earn profit from the clients that they work with. So we understand that, but it, it's a little bit more subtle. So instead of trying to have them refer to us for the express purpose of us to sell them a fee-based offering, the best case scenario is for them to refer to us to educate, and then from there we can move on. That ties very nicely to the whole concept of going to libraries. And a number of you and, and I've been visiting over the past few days, this is a great time to approach libraries in your community, whereby you would offer to set up this class, 27 Mistakes, at the local libraries. Now, when I first heard about this whole library strategy, I, I was a little cool on the idea. I thought, well, that doesn't seem real relevant. Why go to a library if you're trying to reach small business owners? 
Well, increasingly libraries have dedicated reference librarians focused on small businesses in, in the community. And so I don't know if your library or any given library that you may approach has a, a focus or an emphasis on small businesses, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do. And of course, you could reach out to them and find out. When we go to a library, now that we have our 501c3 designation, and we can provide you the, 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 the documentation for that if needed, they typically will provide you a room for free. Now, if we're going to teach this curriculum, we have to understand that the room is only half of the ingredients we need. We also need an audience. So we've seen it work two very different ways. Some libraries will be like, well, fine, here's a room and, and, and you're good to go. Or others will say, well, okay, I see the value in this. We'll put this on our calendar. We'll promote it out to the, the library uh, card holders membership and, and help drive people in. One of the first library workshops that I did was at, a, at, a, at the Tyler Library, Tyler, Texas, 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and we had 61 people attend, 61 people. It was great. Now, some of them were pre-launch, some of them were early stage, and frankly, there was just some people there because it was an event and they just came in to see what it was about. But what a great way to create a funnel by going out and leading with education. So frankly, you could go to your library if you wanted, if, if the, the environment allows for it, try to set up this class to be held no less than once a month, the more often the better. And then when you're talking to the banker, then that could be the outlet. Oh, by the way, you know, I teach a one hour educational curriculum. It is just so valuable. We teach small businesses what they need to know to qualify for a capital raise. We teach them the 27 mistakes to avoid and conversely what to, to do. And I teach that over at the library the first Saturday of every month, for example. So keep in mind, the, the banker referral strategy doesn't have to be intertwined with you teaching this live, but it does fit together nicely. Don't be concerned if, if you don't feel that you're ready or, or just don't want to, to get in front of a room and, and teach. That's okay, because again, the message is recorded, it's available on YouTube, and you can use that on-demand version as a substitute. The hybrid that I've seen a few of you do actually is gather a group of people and you're kind of the MC. So you open up the conversation, then you play the YouTube video up on the screen. The library is going to have the AV equipment. And then at the end of that, then you take it back over. Libraries typically aren't going to mind that we have resources to help small businesses after we've educated them but libraries are not going to want us to pitch anything or sell anything or enroll anyone in anything while in the library. So it's a way to create a lead pool, but you wouldn't seek to have a conversion at the library that would be frowned upon. You'll always know if you did a good job because when you have a good experience at the library, they're gonna say, well, can you come back again? That was great, that was great. So, and that's typically what you would expect to happen. So let, let me conclude my part and then I wanna open it up for your feedback. So to generate income as a distribution partner, you need to have conversions. And the only way to have conversions is to have leads. We've have, we have a video up on the IIMFL website for primary ways, free ways to get leads. But certainly education is a great way to create a knowledgeable pool of leads. And this 27 mistake curriculum, I think hits the nail right on the head. It is, is relevant. It can be a bit intimidating because we're talking about a number of, of topics that the average small business owner doesn't have their affairs in order on, but you're always bouncing back and saying, look, each source of capital has its own underwriting criteria. You don't have to meet all of these checklists, but the more that you meet, the more credible you are and the more access to capital you have. And then what you're going to do is then pivot them into a program. 
You could pivot them into the access to capital program where there's no upfront cost. If it's your preference, you can bring them into the Capital Ready 2.0 where you're collecting 2,500 from them and keeping half. Or you could even just plug them into the four week curriculum, the small business certification. It's really up to your preference what you want to convert them into as far as the resource that's going to help them apply what they've learned. So let's dig into your questions, comments, concerns. We've got a big crowd today, a lot of great minds. A number of you have been very active. Uh, we did the numbers this morning. We're averaging eight new enrollments per hour in the Access to Capital program. Now, again, it just launched this week. But uh, I, I told you yesterday, I think that we'll reach 1,000 enrollments in our first month of the no upfront cost, $1,000 guaranteed capital raise program. And, and we are early on on track for that. A number of you have been instrumental in driving in material numbers. So thank you for that. Okay, so Julius has got a question, but we, and I'll get to that, but we've got so many other people on the line. We've got Alicia, Anna Marie, Annette, Anthony, Charlotte, Christopher, Clarissa, Kwong, Daniel, Daniel, Edna, Glenn, Erlande, Joseph, Julius, uh, Margaret, Peggy, Robert, Tony, Will, and others. And so if I want your feedback, I mean, do, do you like this approach? Do you have questions about this approach? Will you use this approach? Do you have a better approach to filling your funnel of leads? Because again, if the goal on the right end of the continuum is money going into your account, you're going to need, of course, leads to convert. All right, so Julius had, his first, had the first question, how are affiliates paid for their funded referrals? So affiliate, so we, we, we opened the call saying that there's different distribution partner roles, affiliates, financial literacy educators, branch managers, joint venture partners. Each serve a different role, each have a different comp model. But the affiliate role is the one that's a no brainer. Not, not to say that the others aren't valuable, but to be an affiliate, there's no cost to be an affiliate. There's no required purchases. While we're not MLM or network marketing, we pay overrides and those overrides are three levels deep. Maybe you dismiss that, but I'll tell you, and this is a strong statement, I think you're foolish to do so. We just signed a new large African-American chamber as an affinity partner. We were having our implementation call yesterday with the president of that chamber and two board members. And they love the fact that we have overrides because you know what that chamber executive knows? He knows other chamber executives. And now all of a sudden there's gonna be overrides come into that chamber. So when it's introduced properly, override commissions are valuable because people can recognize revenue by introducing and helping others. But Julius's question was quite simple. How are affiliates paid? Well, affiliates are paid 1% of the capital raise and affiliates are paid $1,000 for each client that enrolls in the Access to Capital program once they submit their deferred refundable deposit. That's probably out of context for some of you that have not been on the trainings regularly, but that is the answer to Julius's question. Secondly, Julius, if the affiliate is willing to serve as the mentor for clients that they enroll, then they get paid on average an extra thousand dollars for working with the client over the initial four week period, which includes weekly 15 minute mentoring calls and helping the client set up their key person policy. If you take advantage of our offer for you to enroll in the Access to Capital program yourself, Julius, with no upfront cost, you'll see what the role of the mentor is. And many of you are saying, well, I, I could do that. I'd love to do that. And making an extra thousand dollars a client is uh, attractive. Okay, so hopefully that answered your question, Julius, but uh, we can get more details if you need it. Okay, so let's dismiss that. And so, of course, yeah, we, we have the, the PowerPoint version of this as well as the YouTube. You'll find the YouTube playing here on 27mistakes.org. Robert says, excellent. All right, Tony's asking about the, that joint venture promotion. So again, what we rolled out, it was last month and it was supposed to have been for a narrow window, but we extended it through October 15th, one week from today. 
is that you can become a joint venture partner at a, a greatly reduced rate, almost, uh, almost no cost. But what that means is then we do a 50-50 revenue split with you. So instead of earning one point on the capital raise, you're earning half of the performance fee. The amount of the performance fee varies by which program they're in, but now you're making three to 5% of the capital raise versus one. But the joint venture role, it, it has a fee. It includes the training for free. So you'd come in, spend the day Friday with us, has some more bells and whistles. But, but most importantly though, the joint venture partnership is intended for people that are producers. It's not dabblers. You can be an affiliate and be a dabbler, but you can't be a joint venture partner and be a dabbler. If you're not converting at least 10 clients a month, then you're in the wrong seat as a joint venture partner. Thank you, Tony, for that. Uh, Glenn's asking about the financial literacy educator role. So to be a financial literacy educator, we need to get you licensed. Well, why do you need to be licensed? Because you're teaching on and implementing financial instruments that require by state law licensure. And so you could simply have a life insurance license to be able to set up the collateral assignment. Some of you also have securities license, which is not required, but, but fine if you have that. So we do need more financial literacy educators to handle the growth. We can assign you clients that you can mentor. Of course, you can develop your own clients that you're mentoring. And with the override, uh, you can have a team of, of sub affiliates that are out generating clients for you to mentor. In our model now, all clients going through any of the curriculum options will be assigned a financial literacy educator who will work with them one-on-one, -on -one, once a week over the initial four-week period and will help them set up their collateral assignment. The comp for that equates to around $1,000 for each client you mentor. You may be busy, you may be successful, and you may say, oh, thousand dollars is not worth my time but if you do the math it's actually not bad at all because each mentoring session usually is 15 to 30 minutes let's say it's 30 minutes a week so that's two hours of time and you're making an extra on average a thousand dollars so if you're already earning over five hundred dollars an hour i guess your time's too valuable but my hunch is that some of you are not currently earning on average or in any substantive substantial manner, uh, number of hours over $500 an hour. So it's great income to help these small business owners navigate through the system, have a designated point of contact that's assisting them, and then of course helping them with their asset protection. All right, so uh, what we're going to do here, if you have any other questions, that's fine, but what I'd like you to do is, is get close to, oh, Anna Marie asked, yes, yeah, so we have a uh, great training for those of you that either need to get licensed or are licensed. And so you won't hear us talk a lot about that on these eight o'clock sessions because this is for the general audience, but we have specific training and resources for those of you that are financial literacy educators. And so um, just, just reach out uh, to us if you need assistance in becoming licensed or uh, what have you. And Clarissa, I, I see your email there, so I'll follow up with you. Okay, what I'd like to do is get each of you to take a moment in the Q&A box and let me know, are you interested or not interested in teaching the 27 mistake curriculum? Now that could be teaching online via Zoom, that could be teaching in person, but what I'd like to do is just get do a, a quick poll, and I should have set up a, a poll, which is a function of Zoom. But if you could each just put in the text box. So looking for responses from each of you. So Alicia, Anna, Annette, Anthony, Charlotte, Christopher, Clarissa, Kwong, Daniel, I'm looking for, thank you, Daniel, just responded. Um, if, if each of you. Now, you do not need to be licensed to teach this curriculum. So don't, don't make that mistake. We need to do the background check so that way we're protected from liability that we don't accidentally put Bernie Madoff out in front of a group talking about 
uh, financial affairs. So we need to do the background check, but you don't have to be licensed to teach this curriculum. Of course, you need to be licensed to, to, to set up the policies with clients, of course. And so, okay, so we got quite a few people interested. To, to get this started, what you need to do is to have a plan. And, and the plan is, am I gonna teach it in person or online? If it's in person, then we typically want a host involved because it puts too much burden on you. You don't want to go rent a room, pay for a room, and then figure out how to get butts in the seats. That, that's a lot of work. That's not what we should be doing. Instead, we should reach out to hosts. Libraries are a great place to start. So for all of you that have said, yes, I'm interested, I would start with going to your local library. You can take this flyer here. I emailed it out to all of you. If you didn't receive it, let us know and uh, I can resend it. But essentially, if you took this flyer, and again, you, you really want to emphasize here in the bottom right hand corner, and we just received it yesterday, so we, we can say it now, we couldn't before. We have received our 501c3 designation. It's, it's real, it's official, it's not, oh, maybe it's going to happen or it's pending, it's real. We've got the documentation. So when you go to a local library, which is what we're encouraging you to do, and say, I'm with a 501c3, we'd like to come in and teach some financial literacy lessons here at the library. Here's the flyer, so you'll have this. This is a, an overview of, of what uh, we'd like to teach on. There's even a link at the bottom that Mr. or Mrs. Librarian, you can go listen to it to make sure that you feel like it's credible. And I'd like to set this up at least once but preferably on a reoccurring basis. So, so that's the, the to do, the next step, the, the challenge, the request for each of you that said, yeah, I'd like to teach it. And again, uh, you can either play the recording and you be the MC, or you can take it in and actually teach the actual slides. That's irrelevant at this point, but we need a host. Now, if you're more of the, the online focus, then that's fine. We don't necessarily need a host. We're just going to need to get an event set up. Maybe you're going to use Eventbrite to set it up. Maybe you're a member of a Facebook group or a meetup group, but you need some plan. We need some plan to be able to have the, the event. You're going to want to have registrations because if you don't have registrations, then you don't know uh, who to follow up with. So you want to figure out a plan, either in person and or online, and we need to have a registration aspect involved so you know who's expected to come. And then you check off those that attended, and so those are your hottest leads, aren't they? And then even those that didn't attend, whether it be in person or online, you can follow up and still offer to assist. So that's really what each of you, I encourage you to do is to um, to teach to lead through education all right so let's go through the, the last of these questions here and then um, if you have other questions you can type it in so uh, Kwong says yes I like to make a video 27 mistakes and use this video to help others great great so I mean it, it's available right now at 27mistakes.org um, some of you are bilingual and you may want to actually translate that into other languages. Otherwise, it, it's kind of ready to go. I don't know that you'd have to recreate it, Kwong, but it's, it's uh, up, up to you. Anthony asks, are the people we enroll in the Access to Capital automatically in your affiliate downline? No, but, but you should do that. I, I would encourage you, and, and it comes back to this right here. So, Anthony, let's go over to this section. When we're educating people, this is a key concept that a lot of people don't understand. There's only three places that capital can come from to grow a business. Only three. Debt-based, number one. Equity-based, number two. Earned income, number three. And we've talked about this before. Earned income's the best, right? That's where you're selling more donuts or making more quilts or putting more mufflers on cars, whatever your business is. And the more of that you do profitably, the more money that's left over you can inject back in. 
what you and I know, Anthony, is a lot of people, their business is not generating excess income. And therefore, they might be interested in becoming a sub affiliate of yours. Didn't cost them anything. And just like with the chamber example, which was true, I mentioned a moment, a few minutes ago from yesterday, that almost everyone knows other people that are similar. And so small business owners typically know other small business owners and can refer. So what I would encourage you to do is, is proactively build your affiliate downline. Uh, offer that to your clients, offer that to your referral sources. Now, bankers are not going to become an affiliate, right? They're not going to be able to accept income for referrals. But, but pastors and chambers and other organizations certainly and individuals could. So you'll want to, to make a vested interest in, uh, in my opinion, of building your affiliate downline because there, there's just a perfect match between helping clients access capital and building your affiliate network because number three is crucial, earned income. Okay, let's see if I missed any other questions here. Peggy has a small community center to teach, great. Great. And, and remember this, and I, and I think it's, it's what's really special about our program, one of the elements. We work often with pre-launch and very early stage. And so going to a library or a community center, like Peggy mentioned, you'll often get more early stage entrepreneurs. Well, that's great. Those are the people that usually aren't receiving assistance elsewhere. And so what are we going to teach them? It's learning objective number one, how to even properly set up your business because most small businesses don't understand how to build their EIN, their Dun & Bradstreet, their Experian business, their Equifax business, so they can access some sources of capital off their EIN without using personal credit as part of the curriculum. Helping them understand why it's important to have a lender compliant loan package, which of course is what you and I help them do through the process how to become more credible in the eyes of lenders. What are different things that they could be doing they probably aren't already to improve their access to capital? And again, that, that's it's not secrets, it's all included in this, this curriculum. Teach them how to run their business like a business. You know, how many small businesses are not tracking revenue and expenses properly? They're not able to easily generate interim financial statements, income statements and balance sheets because they're, they're not running their business like a business, either because they don't know or they don't have the funds. Well, if they don't have the funds, then they certainly need to be working with you and I to go get the funds from one of those three or more, one or more of those three options. And of course, ultimately what we want to do is, is help them after the 27 mistake curriculum to uh, plug into one of the programs. All right, and Joseph says he's in. So I feel like you're ready. So what you need to do is figure out your plan in summary. Either you're gonna teach in person and or online. If it's in person, you probably need a host. A host should provide the space and help fill the butts in the seats. It shouldn't be your burden to go rent space and it shouldn't be your burden to go have to spend money to put butts in the seats. That's what a host does. And the host could be set up as an affinity relationship where we do a revenue share or not, just depending upon those circumstances. Secondly, uh, we can teach online and there's just an infinite number of ways that you can teach it online. But if we take action, if we start educating, we're gonna build a bigger funnel and a bigger funnel is going to result in more conversions and more conversions are going to result in more income. Did you know that with the landing pages that we're creating for all of you that we can upload lists? So let's take Joseph, for example. He's a licensed realtor in Arkansas. Let's say that he sets up one of these 27 mistake um, seminars or workshops at a library in Arkansas. And let's say 50 people register, but only 20 show up. That wouldn't be unrealistic. But he has 50 names and emails. He can send that over to us in an Excel file. We can upload it into his list, his list, not into the communal list. Now all of those 50 are in the drip marketing campaign, helping him convert more. So don't forget, with these landing pages, you have dedicated lists. We can import into your list and we can do enter them into the drip marketing campaign 
where every three days they're getting a nice educational touch. So with that being said, we're here to help you. You just, you've got to take some action. You know, when we talk about earned income, that first word is earned. And so we need to earn it by educating in, the, in today's example. Thanks everyone. We'll see you back tomorrow morning. Have a great day. Bye-bye.